Our guest in this first segment, a nice guy, too, kind enough to pick up the tab on all of those free radon <laughs> test kits they're giving out today. The U.S. Attorney for the Northern District, Bill Elenfeld, also a former senator in uh, West Virginia's legislature. Bill, good morning. Thanks so much for being with us. You're welcome. Good morning. I didn't realize I was picking up the tab for all those kits, but it's it, it's good to know. I, I need to yes. uh, set aside some money out of my paycheck this week. <laughs> well, it's pretty pricey, Bill. So, <laughs> so set a lot aside, if you will. They, they are free rate right on test kits, so don't set, don't set aside too much. Uh, Bill, let's let's talk about this uh, major bust that took place uh, as you've returned to office as the Northern Attorney, uh, Northern District uh, U.S. Attorney in the Biden administration, and uh, this involves several people. Uh, lots of drugs and cash as well. Tell us about this. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this is a case we've been working on for some time, and it was a, a drug organization that was headquartered in the sleepy little town of Bel Air, Ohio, which is right across the river from Moundsville, West Virginia, and Marshall County. But uh, th- despite its location sort of off the beaten path in an area that's uh, sort of a soft spot for law enforcement, there's not a lot of uh, there's really no federal law enforcement presence in that part of Ohio. Uh, this individual was able to operate a large-scale drug trafficking organization. His name is Rico McGee, and he is someone who had prior uh, drug felony convictions and really was quite sophisticated. And over the years, he developed contacts with people in other parts of the country and other parts of the world and was uh, conspiring with individuals in Mexico to cause large amounts of drugs to be shipped across the country to uh, to where he lives in uh, eastern Ohio. And then from there, it was uh, sort of a hub, a, a distribution center. He was distributing drugs throughout northern uh, the northern panhandle and north central West Virginia. So Clarksburg, Morgantown, Fairmont, Wheeling, Weirton, and other places. And uh, the, 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 the quantities were enormous uh, of cocaine, methamphetamine, and fentanyl. And and the way that the drugs were coming across the country were via tractor trailer for the most part, sometimes by package and parcel. And then in order to keep the money out of the U.S. banking system, which could have potentially brought scrutiny upon their organization by law enforcement, they actually had individuals fly from California to the Pittsburgh International Airport, pick up cash, and then fly it back out west uh, and, uh, and and there, thereby not depositing it into the, the U.S. banking system. So they uh, went to great lengths to avoid uh, being detected, uh, but ultimately we were able to take it down, and, uh, and, and we have uh, a number of individuals in custody, and, and there's still a couple that we're looking for. Bill, is, does a case like this break on an informant giving some information to tip a clue or is it basically someone kind of noticing a pattern and bringing it to law enforcement's attention i would say it's it's both this was an individual who as i said when we announced this who was notorious he was someone that law enforcement knew about uh, but because uh, he was very careful with how he operated he was someone who was difficult to get into he was careful not to come into West Virginia for the most part. Uh, he stayed in, in Ohio, in Bel Air, Ohio, a, you know, a small town with a, I think it's actually a village, not a town, mm-hmm. uh, which, uh, which it is, means it has fewer people in a town as far as they do things in Ohio. A couple of police officers, no DEA, ATF, FBI in that area. So uh, he was very careful in how he operated. But he slipped up. At one point in time, he did come into West Virginia. He came into Wheeling. He uh, did a deal uh, uh, over uh, in our state, and we happened to be watching. And so that was uh, very helpful to us to have him actually in West Virginia uh, distributing cocaine. It was a small amount, but we just to have him over here doing that transaction was very helpful. And then we did have some individuals who were cooperating with us, and that's always helpful, too. Uh, and then there were just uh, countless hours of surveillance by our drug task force officers and one of the one of the things they noticed when they were doing the surveillance uh, was that either Mr. McGee or lieutenants in his organization were making trips to the airport, and uh, they began to follow them on their way to the airport uh, to try to figure out what what they were doing. And ultimately, 
after following them a couple of times, we realized they were making an exchange with someone who was flying in to Pittsburgh, literally meeting with someone from the McGee organization, picking up a package, and then going right back into the airport and getting on a plane and flying back to the West Coast. And so we began to work with individuals at the airport, uh, with law enforcement based there, uh, pulling camera footage from uh, that facility, and it all came together. Uh, so uh, it was just a lot of hard work, with some help from some informants, and then maybe a few slip-ups by the key people in the organization. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, Bill. I've, uh, I was impressed by the number of people that were involved, and I'm going to just name a few uh, on your list. The U.S. Marshal Service, the ATF, uh, the West Virginia uh, State Police, Ohio State Police, Ohio County Sheriff's Department, Drug Enforcement Administration, Wheelan Police Department, uh, the uh, uh, couple of local sheriff's office and prosecuting attorney. It's a fairly impressive list. Even more impressive to me would be how all that was coordinated. Who was in charge, Bill, and how how did you get everybody working together, pulling together, and yet keeping it fairly quiet? You're right. It, it's, uh, it is an impressive list, and we would not have been successful in this case without those partnerships. We, we will not be successful going forward as we uh, push back against the drug cartels in Mexico without those partnerships. In fact, we will fail unless we work together like we did in this case. No one agency can do it on their own. And that, of all the things we have going for us, the partnerships, in my opinion, is the number one most important thing that we have. And so the the key group in, in this investigation was the Ohio Valley Drug Task Force, which is comprised of the Wheeling Police Department, Ohio County Sheriff's Department, West Virginia State Police, and the DEA. So they, they led the way. But we needed the help of our friends in Ohio, and so we reached out. I, I personally reached out and sat down and met with the Belmont County, Ohio prosecutor, with the Belmont County Sheriff's Department. Uh, we worked with Ohio Highway Patrol, and without their help, uh, our, our friends right across the river, this would not have happened. And so, uh, but we, we all of us do this all the time, and you're always, you know, worried about someone finding out that you're looking into a high-level target, but it, it, it never got out with this group. Um, we were uh, n- Nobody let, let it be known that we were looking at Mr. McGee and others in his organization. Had that happened, it could have caused a major problem. It, uh, we might not have been successful. It, it could have you know, jeopardized the safety of those involved in the investigation. So not easy to do, but this was just a fabulous group uh, to work with. Very impressive. I was intrigued by a point that you made a, a couple minutes ago that uh, Mr. McGee made a mistake by coming into West Virginia on one occasion. Why was he avoiding West Virginia? Is our police force more sophisticated? It was he, why, the question is, why did he avoid coming to West Virginia? He avoided coming to West Virginia for the same reason others avoid coming over here, at least into the northern panhandle, because we do have a robust federal law enforcement presence here. Uh, we do um, we, we are very aggressive in prosecuting the cases that that come before us over here, and in in Ohio, you know, it's it's you know just a couple miles from from Wheeling. It's a different federal judicial district. They have different priorities and I, it, it, and this isn't a criticism of of my friends and colleagues that work in the US Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Ohio but their focus is on Columbus and Cincinnati and Dayton and they have their hands full with those major cities uh, with uh, large population bases I did so not- they don't pay as much attention to Belmont County Ohio and Jefferson County Ohio and Guernsey County Ohio and it's almost as if um, we have to keep an eye on that over here in West Virginia. So for that reason, uh, some of those who operate, uh, you know, criminals who are operating understand that, and they know that they're better off just to stay uh, where they are and, and not come over to West Virginia. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, and this was one of the specific counts in the indictment, uh, Mr. McGee was charged with a distribution in Wheeling, West Virginia, and, and that was the specific instance uh, that I was referring to. That's very interesting. I, w- I was not aware, aware of the, that uh, 
uh, cross-state dynamics. Another question. Uh, they're in, incarcerated now. When will, they, when will they be going to court? So uh, they – all of them have at least appeared in court for an initial appearance to either uh, be able to post bond or not. A number of them, uh, and it's a little different than the federal system, you don't actually get to post bond. You're either released or you're not. And we have moved to detain a number of these individuals, and the court has agreed that they should be detained. Um, so uh, they all will have trials set within 60 days. Uh, this is uh, a, a case that I expect, uh, for the most part, will be resolved uh for most of these individuals within 60 days, either via a plea or a trial. Um, and then, uh, we, of course, we have one individual, Mr. Magana, uh, who uh, we still we, we have we have not yet arrested. We're still um, searching for him. Uh, so that's going to uh, be a little bit down the road um, until he appears in court and has his trial date set. Now, uh, Mr. Magana is one that's from, uh, from Mexico, per se. Isn't it? Is, that, is that correct? Yes, uh, his his address, uh, as listed in the press release, was Sinaloa, Mexico. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can we assume he's part of that cartel? I, I can't say that. Um, I, I think uh, it, it's fair to make that inference, but but we're not able to say that at this point in time, uh, other than we believe he's in Sinaloa, Mexico. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The impression I had from your press release was that Mr. Magana was uh, uh, provided the bulk of the material to uh, uh, for distribution. He provided the bulk of the material to the states, and then it was distributed by Mr. McGee once he got the material in Ohio. Is that correct? That's correct. So he was uh, the primary supplier for Mr. McGee, not the only supplier. In in that business. You normally have more than one person or organization who's going to supply your product. But uh, we identified Mr. Magana as the primary supplier and uh, as the person responsible for causing these shipments to be made via tractor trailer parcels and packages uh, across the country. And then uh, Mr. McGee would go and meet the tractor trailer. He actually had what we call a trap car. So he would travel from his home in Bel Air uh, north to the Turnpike in Ohio. He would meet the truck that had traveled across the country. He would pick up the drugs, and then he would be able to conceal the drugs in his car to the point that most law enforcement officers would not recognize uh, where the drugs were hidden. It was incredibly sophisticated. Uh, The entire front seat of the car could lift up, uh, to, to reveal an area where drugs could be concealed. The seat would be put back down, and there were a couple of levers that had to be pulled in order for that seat to be triggered back up. And so he felt comfortable driving down the road, and had he been pulled over uh, for speeding or anything else, uh, he, he would have welcomed a search of his car because uh, he, he would have had the confidence that the, the officer wouldn't find what he was concealing. Uh, fortunately, we have that car now. Uh, we've, we, we know how uh, to get into it, and we actually have shared it with uh, all of the police officers in this region so that they, they know, uh, they, they have one more piece of information about how drugs are being concealed in automobiles. Bill, would a drug sniffing dog be able to detect that? Uh, yes, but um, it, it, the police officer would have to decide to take that step and. Um, and, and if there's no other reason to uh, to call in a dog, um, uh, n- no other suspicion, then that that might not happen. Mm-hmm. So, but yes, you're, you're right, Rob. That if a dog were there and they were just to run it, um, do an open air sniff around the car, there's a good chance that a dog would hit on that. With the, especially with the the quantities that we're talking about here. You see 75 pounds of cocaine, 19 pounds of meth, 5 pounds just about of fentanyl. With that size seizure, does fentanyl get treated any differently than the cocaine or the meth, considering the most deadly nature of fentanyl? So uh, we have to use the federal sentencing guidelines and those guidelines set forth the penalties for uh, drugs and and that goes by specific weight and so in our indictment you'll see that we charged 
the fact that he possessed a certain amount of cocaine and a, a certain amount of fentanyl, a certain amount of methamphetamine. Um, so that the, I, I, the fentanyl probably um, it should, they, they probably should change the guidelines because they, they, they haven't been adjusted since I think 2018. And the, the fentanyl problem has gotten obviously uh, tremendously worse. Uh, it's become much more prevalent. Um, but uh, based upon the quantities here, that's not a problem for us. There, there's so much of it that um, uh, there are going to be harsh penalties handed down for all those involved. What happens to those drugs after seizure? I assume you have to keep them around for the trial, and, and eventually what happens? Uh, eventually the drugs will be destroyed. Uh, the, uh, once all of the individuals have had the opportunity to go to trial and file any appeals, that, that may be appropriate. Then we seek a, an order of destruction, and then the DEA takes possession and destroys the, the evidence. Bill, did uh, you track uh, Mr. Magana at all? In other words, do you know whether did he use the same port of entry each time, uh, or did vary? And was it a major port of entry, or anything about getting the drugs from Mexico to the U.S.? We have, and I, I can't. I'm not at liberty to give those details mm-hmm. now, uh, but uh, when we get to trial, that evidence will be offered. Uh, as to how the drugs actually got into the United States and how they got across the country. Bill Elenfeld is our guest. He is the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District and uh, recently involved in a major drug bust uh, in addition to the drugs that were seized, about $300,000 in cash, uh, firearms, and property as well in the form of real estate, possibly, and also vehicles. What happens to the property, Bill, as this process goes along, and the cash? So yeah, we identified, as you said, Rob, a large amount of cash, um, at least 11 parcels of real estate, a uh, large number of automobiles. Uh, we have filed notice, uh, a notice of forfeiture for all of those items because we, have, uh, we, we are alleging that those uh, items were either used in furtherance of the drug trafficking enterprise or drug proceeds were used to acquire those items. And so uh, the actual owner of those items, whether that's Mr. McGee or others, some of these items were put into the names of other people, but, but used by Mr. McGee, which is something that's pretty common. Um, so it's our burden of proof to show uh, that, that, as I just said, the, these were uh, acquired with proceed, drug proceeds or used in furtherance thereof. If the property owners wish to contest the forfeitures, they can. Um, and, and then we would have a hearing on that. If ultimately those items are forfeited to the government, then those items will be, uh, you know, the cars and property will be sold and liquidated. And the, and the, the cash obviously is already in liquid form. Those, uh, a large portion of that money will go to the investigative agencies. And so there'll be a, a, a division of, of that money uh, through uh, a, 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 a formula that the DEA has. And so the, the agencies that you, you rattled off there earlier that were involved will share in uh, the, the forfeiture. And then there's also a, a percentage that goes back to the federal government, to the U.S. Marshal Service that oversees the, the national um, asset forfeiture program. Bill, the money going back to the uh, local organizations or the state organization, are there any conditions ap- applied to the how the funds are to be used? Yes. And so, it, you know, if the city of Wheeling, for example, it, you know, they're, they're involved in that task force. And so the Wheeling Police Department will, will certainly share in the, the, the total forfeiture. The, the money has to go back into drug law enforcement. So uh, it will be used for future investigations, for equipment that's needed to do investigations, for, for money that's needed to buy evidence, you know, when we make drug buys from dealers in order to build cases. And so, so yes, so there are conditions. It's got uh, it, to go back into to what they're already doing. And so that, that's the nice thing about cases like this is we're going to be able to reinvest uh, the, the assets that have been seized into future drug investigations, which just makes the, the task force uh, that much stronger and that much 
uh, better position to do investigations down the road. If found guilty, uh, Mr. McGee and the other folks involved, what are the maximum penalties they're facing? So uh, the penalties are going to depend upon the criminal history of each of the defendants and then the offense level. So uh, if if you're like Mr. McGee and you have multiple prior felony convictions and, and other convictions, his, his criminal history is quite substantial. Um, his his exposure is much greater, uh, especially when you include the weight um, of, of the drugs. And then uh, the firearms, those are also uh, items that cause sentence enhancements. And so when we arrested Mr. McGee that morning in October, he was laying in bed and he had a couple of ounces of cocaine and a firearm next to his bed. Um, that's that's not a good thing for someone who um, is is arrested on these charges to have that firearm there. Um, so he's he's looking at the longest of them all. And uh, and then we have others who uh, don't have criminal histories at all. We had people who were just flyers. And by that, I mean, these were guys who were just flying across the country to pick up cash and fly it back, uh, who who can't believe that they're now facing charges in West Virginia, a state that they'd never set foot in. So they will not face the same type of penalty as Mr. McGee because they don't have the same criminal history. Now, they still face uh, lengthy time, a uh, lengthy prison time, but uh, it won't be as long because they don't have prior felonies. Bill, you mentioned that uh, the one gentleman had cocaine and the firearm next to his bed when he was apprehended. Were, were there any incidents involved in the apprehension of these individuals? Any resistance? No, fortun- fortunately, uh, there, there were no incidents. No one was harmed. Uh, law enforcement did a fabulous job. Uh, especially with Mr. McGee. He, he was the, the one where uh, we found the gun next to the bed. Um, the, he, he, was, he was surprised, and, and that's, that's how you want to do it. Um, when when you, may, you have these types of operations, you don't want them to know that you're coming, and, and he certainly didn't. So no one was harmed. Uh, we've also just recently made arrest out in San Diego uh, uh, without incident. Uh, we worked closely with the DEA there. They were able to safely apprehend two individuals uh, who uh, who were also flyers who were responsible for flying across the country to pick up cash and take it back. And Bill, as deadly as fentanyl is, we know a small amount can kill so many people. When it comes to these busts and what you're essentially seizing, what is the protocol for the agents who are involved in rounding up this material and making sure that they're safe and not direct contact with anything that might kill them? Yeah, so you're, that's a good point. They have to be especially cautious when they're handling these types of gr- drugs. We have had uh, not not in in northern West Virginia, to my knowledge, but uh, of course in other parts of the country, we have had officers who have overdosed simply because they they touched fentanyl, and then you know so th- there's residue on their their fingers, and then they touch their mouth or they touch their nose like we all do, just uh, out of habit. And then it gets into their system, and if someone doesn't have Narcan, they're not going to make it. Uh, but fortunately, the incidents I'm aware of, uh, police officers have been saved because someone had Narcan available. But no, they, they have to be extra cautious. They're not necessarily wearing um, gear over their face, um, but they, they're, you know, they're handling it with gloves. They're, they're making sure that they wash their hands afterwards. They're keeping it in a secure location. They're keeping it um, contained uh, so that uh, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't do harm to anyone. Uh, we, we've learned a lot about how, how to handle fentanyl over the past several years. Uh, I think uh, maybe we went a little bit too far initially with, with that, but we're still very careful with how we handle it uh, to make sure that law enforcement officers aren't uh, put into harm's way or, or anybody else that, that might be in or around the drugs. Bill, thanks so much for your time this morning. We appreciate your availability. Of course. Thank Thank you, you guys. I appreciate it. And congratulations. Thank you. Bill Elenfeld, he is the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District.